Good afternoon and a very warm welcome to one of the two final sessions of today and obviously of the conference. Well, I say sessions, obviously we have the, uh, the debate after this and the prize giving, which will be, uh, I'm sure, a really great event, but uh, certainly of the, of the panel sessions. Um, a little bit disappointed to see that a few more people didn't stick around, but, but big thank you to everyone who has. Uh, it's great. I, I, think you're, I think you're not going to regret it because I think this is going to be a really interesting discussion. Um, the title, as you can see behind me, is Legal Innovations, uh, Key Legal Strategies, well, What Are Being Deployed to Further Sustainable Finance. Now this is, I should say, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I should also introduce myself. I'm Lucy Fitzgeorge Parker. I'm the editor of Responsible Investor. I am not an expert on uh, law of any description, climate or otherwise. And, but fortunately, I don't need to be because I have three panelists who are. And I will ask them, first of all, to introduce themselves. Uh, Sarah, would you like to start? I think everyone should know you by now, but just in case. Sure. Hi, everyone. Sarah Barker. I'm a partner at Minter Ellison. And I'm, I'm getting told I need to speak into the microphone. <laughs> I'm a partner at Minter Ellison. For those of you who don't know Minter Ellison, we're the Asia Pacific's largest commercial law firm. Uh, so I'm partner and head of climate and sustainability risk governance, director at the Commonwealth Climate and Law Initiative, and chair of the World Economic Forum's uh, climate governance community of experts. Vanessa? Hello, I'm Vanessa Havard williams I'm a consultant at Linklaters. Uh, I was a partner there for quite a long time and set up the environment, climate change and ESG practices. Uh, I also sit on the board of the UK Export Finance Agency and I'm part of the TPT delivery group. Fantastic. And finally, I, I should warn you, but Matt is going to introduce himself, and then he is going to do a, a little introductory talk, which I'm told is going to be like a TED talk. So uh, <laughs> that's a big, a big weight of expectations, perhaps. That, we go that for was it, what Matt. I was asked to do. <laughs> Whether it turns out that way is another matter. Um, so my name's uh, Matthew Gingell, Matt, uh, to most people. Uh, by day, I'm the general counsel of Oxygen House Group, and by night, I'm the founder and chair of the Chancery Lane project, which we will talk about later. So I was asked to um, say a few words to kind of bookend this session and talk about legal innovation. And I have got a few slides, and apologies if they're really bright. I had no idea it was going to be this bigger screen. Um, so thank you. This is, the co co this is commonly known as the graveyard slot. Um, so thank you for turning up, and hopefully over the next hour or so, you'll see how we might reanimate, rewild the legal profession to help sustainable finance. Um, I always start by introducing myself as a non-environmental lawyer, and I do work for a profit-making company, and I think that's really important context to some of the things that I'm going to say. But before we get on to the convergence of legal innovation and sustainable finance, do you know what one of the best kept secrets in the world is? Lawyers are good people. <laughs> <laughs> they just hide it really well in narcissism, greed, and sometimes Latin. <laughs> apart from these people here, of course. Um, and not only are they good people, they are actually superheroes. And they're superheroes because of the, the power they wield. And that is the agency of being involved and facilitating virtually every financial transaction in every economy around the world. And that power manifests itself in the contracts we draft and the advice we give to investors and other financial institutions. But the one power that always eludes lawyers is innovation. We struggle to make innovation work for us. We don't take the vision and push the agenda in a way that's truly innovative. And there are lots of reasons for this. Maybe it's the silo of specialisms that we operate in. Maybe it's the cognitive homogeny of the legal profession but perhaps it's the suffocating snake of a modern corporate partnership. <laughs> no comment. Um, so, innovation always eludes us, but this is where we have sidekicks come to the rescue. Sidekicks are these trusted aides that 
puts the superhero back on the path of the righteous. And one of those psychics I created back in 2019 called the Chancery Lane Project, which is um, it's a really interesting that the last session that I went to was on collective wisdom, but we used the collective wisdom of the legal profession and we brought them together to create the contracts to rewire our economy and to deliver decarbonisation. And the principle we used was using the magic of contracts as a global delivery system. The day-to-day -day contracts that we all use can be used to deliver decarbonisation. And that was the principle we worked on. The theory of change is that if you move day-to-day -day contracts, then legislators can be more ambitious with the legislation they have, they want to introduce because the market has already shifted. So if you change the market norm. And the lawyers assembled. And today there's over 140 clauses covering a wide range of topics that are freely published for any business to use. And there's 37 transposition teams around the world converting it into local jurisdictions, giving it local context, giving it local ESG lenses, which is really exciting. And about 25% of the clauses are related to sustainable finance. These include uh, really interesting equity ratchets for founders who hit net zero in their business quicker, to a plethora of green loan notes and sustainability backed loan type arrangements. Um, please do go and have a look at them. Uh, if not, ask your in-house teams or your um, firms that you use to, to go and use them. And I think for me, this demonstrates the symbiotic nature of legal innovation and sustainable finance because the lawyers advise the financiers on what to do in the contract. They advise them on risk and they facilitate the transaction. So we've got this symbiosis, but today we're swimming in the same direction and all we want to do is feed like the shark and the remora. And I'll leave it to you to decide which one of the shark and the remora is the banker and which one's the lawyer. <laughs> and I think if you ask either, it'll be the, the reverse. <laughs> but our heroes have a new nemesis. The contracts have been drafted. Legislation is too slow. We've heard this a lot today. Climate litigation is also too slow. It's brilliant, but it's too slow, and it's a bit like whack-a-mole at the moment. Um, everything is now termed sustainable or green finance. We've got this kind of erosion of kind of what it actually means as a definition. And ESG is being weaponized across different regions. And there'll be more of that um, to come in the brilliant panel we've got for you shortly. So we've reached a plateau, an innovation plateau, because innovation is not just about the creation and origination of ideas. It's about the adoption and iteration of those. And for me, that's the bit that is missing from a lot of what we've done today, is how do we get to that adoption? How do we get to that iteration so that we're actually making a difference? Um, ben, in his introductory video, called it an inflection point. And I think it is, because we've got the contracts, we've got the liquidity, we've got the projects. So what is stopping us from adopting these innovations? And there's a whole plethora of externalities that we can point to, global instability, um, to name one. But for me, it's the lack of data, because data makes things real. So if I'm advising on a transaction, how do I know whether this route or that route is going to be better for me as a firm, for the planet, and for the investor? We don't know, we don't have the data. So we can't connect it to the real world, and that creates a gap of trust and credibility and also doesn't allow us to negotiate when we're in a contract negotiation position. So I think for legal innovation that supports the scaling and adoption of sustainable finance, we need a carbon data revolution. And by that I mean we need real-time data that allows us to forecast the impact of a transaction in the negotiations so that we can make better decisions and not bake in the behavior that is going to happen for the next 10 years. And one of the things um, I'm working on uh, with a few others in what's called uh, the 1.5 degree charter is a matter attribution tool. And that is a tool that measures the advised emissions 
of a transaction or a piece of advice rather than the operational admissions of a law firm. Because there's no point in a law firm being sustainable in an unsustainable world advising unsustainable clients. We need the knowledge, we need the data, and we need the ability to do that. And that is what a matter attribution tool will do. But that is going to take a huge amount of brain power, a huge amount of uh, finance um, to make that consistent so that every law firm and every client can have that uh, access to that data. And so I think we need a new sidekick. So meet Cliff. Cliff is the Climate Law Innovation Fund. It doesn't exist. Don't Google it. I'm saying it today because I'm fr in front of a lot of investors with a lot of good money to spend. Um, so I think Cliff is this sidekick we need to build the infrastructure for legal innovation that drives sustainable finance adoption. So what am I actually saying? I'm actually saying we probably need sustainable finance to fund legal innovation, which then allows sustainable finance to be scaled and adopted. Um, and I think that is my premise of what I wanted to say. We need sustainable finance to build the infrastructure to allow all the things we've talked about in the last few days to happen. And I appreciate this short talk is full of hyperbole and stereotype. So please don't take it in, the, in that way. But I actually really strongly believe that as a legal profession, we have the privilege of the, these powers and they're to be used not to be kept to maximize the amount we can charge clients, but to be used for good. Because I believe that if we get the sidekicks right, then any ordinary lawyer can be an extraordinary one. And for me, that's really exciting when I want my kids to grow up wanting to be lawyers, not just because it's a rewarding career, but because of the social value we bring to society so that we are valued and not called money grabbing or narcissistic. And we don't hide things in Latin. And I think if we do that, we will change the culture of law. And we've talked a lot, of, I've heard culture talked a lot, um, the culture of collaboration, the cl uh, culture of collective wisdom, the culture of um, data. And so I think, to put it simply, if we change the culture, we will change the world. Thank you. Okay, well, lots of ideas in that and also lots of lovely imagery. I said, I said we should get rid of that and go back to the placeholder, and I now kind of wish we'd stuck with the sloth because it, nice, it was a very nice sloth. Um, so, to our panel, are we, are we feeling cognitively homogenous today? Is this, is this, do we need rewilding? Oh, I, I think if you asked 100 lawyers what their favourite band is, I think they'd all say Coldplay. Um, so, that's, that's an example. Oh, I'll tell you what, actually, I was going, I mean, rather than going um, straight into the first question, I, I'd actually quite like, um, maybe Vanessa and Sarah, you could respond to, to what Matt has, has, has said. I mean, there was a lot of, a lot of food for thought in that. Do, do you want to give us any thoughts arising from that? Other than writing down the terms cognitive homogeny and suffocating <laughs> snake. Um, actually, as you were speaking, Matt, it, 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 first of all, I just want to say thank you for the Chancery Lane project, because you had an idea four years ago and you acted on it. And I think more than any other legal intervention that has occurred so far, it has shifted the dial for those of us who are corporate lawyers in this space. So thank you. I just wanted to acknowledge that publicly. Um, host a child for actually following through on your ideas. Um, what came to my mind when you were talking though, um, and particularly around Cliff, which is not such a silly idea. As I think we as lawyers are the embarrassing missing link in responsible investment. We've done a, I won't say good, but we've done an okay job, a fair job, I'll damn us with faint praise, in getting um, the financial community, directors, executives, C-suite to understand climate and sustainability as a financial risk and opportunity. What we have not done is uh, build the capacity of the gatekeepers to boards and execs in the same way, company secretaries and corporate lawyers. That was really sheeted home to me recently when I was on a panel with the global chair of Deloitte. 
who was talking about um, the new International Sustainability Standards Board financial reporting standards coming in. Deloitte, uh, she said, is investing £1 billion pounds <laughs> between now and 2030 to upskill their accountants on climate and sustainability to be able to advise on the tsunami of climate sustainability related financial information that's coming their way. What are we doing as a legal fraternity? I think the technical legal term is two-fifths of fuck all. Because, um, and I think it comes down to, to two things, well, three things actually. First of all, the nature of climate and sustainability. It's always been around as an issue, but the nature of its relevance has changed. But so we as lawyers are still stuck in thinking about it as a, as a compliance issue. You know, does it comply with the planning laws or not? It's not a compliance issue, it's a risk issue, which requires us to look up and out and connect across silos. We don't think like that as lawyers enough. The second thing is we're still remunerated on the basis of our time. And in that context, there's no incentive to spend, invest time that we need in order to be able to upskill in this new world. So um, Cliff really resonated with me, Matt. I think we need to invest heavily in capacity building for lawyers. Vanessa. I agree with an enormous amount of that. So I'm going to try and um, embroider on it. There was one bit though, Matt, that I disagreed with. Good. Um, <laughs> and that is, I'm not sure that lack of data is the problem. Because we are going to have imperfect data for quite a long time. So it's not that I don't think we, should, we shouldn't do that, but I'm not sure that lack of data is the problem. I, I think lawyers, can, lawyers are part of the, um, should be part of the delivery of change because the way in which transition will be affected is through regulation, one way or another. Um, and what is happening at the moment is we have relatively limited regulation around disclosure that is doing and, and um, capital requirements, and, and that is largely doing the heavy lifting. Uh, and so, if you look at what do we need to develop, we really need to refresh um, legislative frameworks for the economy that's coming. And there is a role for. Um, parliamentary draftsmen, there's a role for policymakers. I think there is also um, a role for private lawyers because understanding what is um, workable in a transactional context is critical. But at the moment, what I see is um, lawyers responding to client demand. And so that will come in relation to particular transactions. It'll come in response to particular financial regulations. So we've got quite we've got a lot of lawyers who are good at sustainable finance disclosure regulation, and uh, more we're growing people who are competent on taxonomy. But the bigger picture piece, which I think is where I agree with um, Sarah, um, the, the strategic importance of this, the the role of the trusted advisor, that I think there is still room for growth on. Um, but I'm not sure that, that data is the solution. I do think client demand, so push your lawyers, um, ask them to engage um, not just in responding to a particular transaction, but to your strategic direction and some of the risks and, and uh, opportunities. And I think you will start to drive a response from the law firms. Um, some of my clients ask me to help them basically look five years ahead and think about their decisions now and how they could get them into trouble or get, you know, position them well. And it's that kind of role, I think, that we need more people to do. I think, so could I come back on that? So um, the thing you should ask your law firms for is their advised emissions data. They don't have it. So that, that is one bit of data, but also um, I want to create a, a climate contracts database so we can see as a research and a policy tool the impact that's happening on the ground. So how do we know how many millions of dollars are going into 
um, a new contract that aligns with 2025? How do we know that as a policy, as a, as a regional um, area? So I, I think there's lots of data that we do need to collect, but I take the point that the data is not the only solution. Well, interestingly, Vanessa, I was going to come on to this question later, but uh, I was, I was, you mentioned the question of so saying to our audience, you know, push your lawyers on this. And I was going to ask which way around is it at the moment? Are the lawyers doing the pushing or are the lawyers being pushed? And it, it sounds as though it's more the lawyers being pushed. Is that, is that correct? Um, so, well, I think it, it depends be between, because, because law is quite a, quite a big market and, and it is quite vertical, you're right. It's quite, quite siloed. So law, transactional and relationship lawyers will respond to the transactions that are coming in and, and what the clients are interested in and also what the clients are not interested in. So if you're not interested and you say, I really don't want to hear about that, then that, that kind of kills um, the appetite. So um, what, what I think is happening is that there is, where lawyers perceive an, an opportunity and that the market is moving, they will respond to that. Um, I think there probably isn't as much as there could be of thought leadership and seeing what's coming next and responding to that. There is some, I'm not, don't get me wrong, but there could be more. Sarah, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think it's marginal. I really think it's marginal in terms of the volume of, of, of thought leadership coming out, certainly from, from corporate law firms. Um, it is primarily market-driven. Um, when I started doing um, sustainability through a commercial law lens a decade ago, it was like, oh, don't let Sarah near Rio Tinto because we don't want her to offend Rio Tinto. And it's only when Rio Tinto asks for Sarah that the law firms understand, oh, there's a commercial opportunity, therefore it's an area that we need to get involved in. I think this is part of the, the, the problem with the profession as a whole, as I said before, that we're so used to um, checking for compliance mm -hmm. that we've lost our ability to be risk advisors. That's something that the strategy teams do. That's something that McKinsey does. That's not something that a law firm does. And we also, I think as you said, Matt, or maybe it was you in the intro, someone said, we, we think in silos, we're structured in silos. So um, I talk about my team having to be multilingual mm. and that's our point of difference. Yes, we speak law, we have to. You have to be a really good black letter lawyer but you also have to speak sustainability, you have to speak finance, you have to speak exec, and you have to speak board. And our job is, is, is almost not necessarily as strategists, but translators as well, to, to help um, communicate with each of those cohorts in a language that resonates with them. So, for example, with these heat waves in Europe and the US this week, it's actually a delight compared to last year that it's not 40 degrees here. Um, you know, if you think about the way that a, a, a sustainability person might talk about the heat waves and uh, as being an issue of their own sake and, and the potential impacts for mass migration and on, on the environment and blah, 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 blah. That's not the way you talk to a lawyer about it. You talk to a lawyer about it in terms of, well, what does this mean for our potential liabilities under workplace health and safety laws? What does it mean for force majeure in terms of supply chain interruption. And if you're talking to a CFO or an exec, you talk about, well, what does it mean for supply chain interruption when there's no water left in the Rhine and we can't get anything shipped out of Germany? So I think it's, it's really important to, yes, be innovators, yes, be strategic, but also be translators across those silos. And I can't even remember what the question was, I've just scrambled. <laughs> I, th I think it's really interesting that we're talking about legal innovation in the context of just putting out some thought leadership. <laughs> it, 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 I think it shows the enormity of the problem yeah. um, we have. But we, we, what we're actually saying is that if more law firms put out what they actually thought, I think the world would recognize that there are good people there and they do want to help in the transition. So I, it just gets conflicted in these silos where you don't want to say one thing without affecting the other, the other side of the firm. Is that? Yeah, and that's, that is a, a big problem. Yeah, so, so for me as a client, 
I want to instruct law firms that are on balance helping the transition rather than hindering it. And so that is the outset I have. And I think if this creates conflict for sustainable <coughs> investment communities when instructing their lawyers, because they see, right, we want to make this impact or we want to drive this behavior over here, but the firm is also acting for this, this client over here. And it creates that inherent tension that causes a paralysis of innovation, I think. I'm, I'm not <coughs> sure I agree with that. Um, I think there are, I think that is that, that puts it too high, actually. Okay. Uh, certainly in my experience, that, that where there are opportunities to innovate, um, I, I don't think there, the, the issue of, well, I act for um, companies for, for whom the transition is harder, um, and therefore I can't say anything in this space. That, that, that doesn't ring true. I think the problem is more um, that, that um, and I, I think this is true actually of professional services more broadly, that we are a bit reactive. And um, what, what, what all the sectors need to do is look above the parapet of business as usual and start to anticipate the very, uh, the, the change that's happening and also the acceleration of the change. Okay, great. Well, I, I, mean, I think this is fascinating because this is not the side of the, the sort of the legal and uh, sustainability debate that we usually hear, which is you know how this actually looks from within the profession and and you know, the, the the barriers to or the the yeah, barriers sort of speed bumps, shall we say, in the way of progressing. Um, but I think we, we do also, um, it sort of segues nicely from uh, what you were saying, Sarah, about the risks to companies, to the area that, that I think we sort of more, most of us, the, the non-lawyers, tend to associate more with uh, sort of the law and the transition, which is uh, litigation. And um, as you were saying, Sarah, you know, there are a lot of risks to companies. Now, I, as I'm, I write for, well, I edit, Responsible Investor, which if you don't know it, really does just do what it says on the tin. We write for responsible investors, whether they're asset managers or pension funds or, or anyone. Um, and so our investors are people who have uh, large portfolios of companies. So they are themselves exposed to, you know, potentially litigation risks in those portfolios. Then again, there are investors who are raising money to fund climate litigation. So there are lots of ways in which um, uh, that litigation piece does affect our core audience investors and you know, investors kind of can be a proxy here for a lot of the financial sector. Um, so from that perspective, what are the, well, let's say this year, what have been the interesting, are there any interesting developments this year that you know, our investor audience um, should, should know about or perhaps should know a bit more about? Maybe Matt, do you want to? Oh, I have no idea about climate litigation. Um, and I, I think from my perspective, um, I really think climate litigation has a really important place in the ecosystem of action. But for me, personally, it's taking far too long. It took um, 782 days for the Friends of the Earth v. Shell case to go through the Dutch courts, and that's in appeal, and Shell have just dumped their um, transition plan. Put that into the context of its 2,357 days until 2030. We have to think of new innovative ways to drive behavior because climate litigation is really important and it creates a really good stick that allows um, the conversation in the boardroom. But we have to be look at the reality of the situation we're in and say we've got finite courts, we've got finite funds to lit litigate and actually is it just no, another cost of being in business for these big, enormous global corporations? But I mean, clearly there is something, something in it because I say people are raising funds to fund. Um, oh, I, to I fun believe in it, and I, <laughs> I promote this it. Stuff, <laughs> um, to fund this stuff, and and they're raising them them quite fast. I mean, Vanessa, what uh, as, as we're talking about the specifically about that those sort of climate that sort of climate litigation, where where do you think we are with that, and where's that where's that heading? So, um, well, Grantham put out their, their climate litigation review last, last month, end of, end of June, um, which is absolutely excellent on, on trends. And that is showing that climate litigation continues to grow, but that the, the, the growth trend has slowed a little bit. Hard to tell whether that's just year on year. Um, it has a role. It's a sign of policy failure and market failure. 
that, that we are that we see strategic litigation like this. It definitely has an impact in that in that clients are concerned. Of course, they're concerned. This is a very difficult um, landscape to navigate. Um, I think the areas that are are most interesting um, or resonate most are the the greenwash risk, which is just exploding, and 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 then that creates also a green hushing issue. People being uncomfortable. Um, I think there's some interesting uh, litigation going on in relation to directors and fiduciary duties, which we will need to track. Um, and also the whole question of um, corporate versus personal liability, whether personal liability will, will um, evolve or not. Um, these are all areas of, um, that, that people are pursuing. And then, and then also looking at the extent, what you just said, actually, the, the amount of money that's going into this is itself interesting. So there are, there's lots, but I tend to agree with you, actually. We um, need to fix the, the, the policy gaps. And I think going back to what I was saying about the convergence of sustainable finance and legal innovation is that there are now funds that fund climate litigation and take a share of the, yeah. the damages. So it's actually become a business with kind of measurable returns to see these businesses. Yeah. And I think if that happened at scale, then you would change the dial, I think, really dramatically. Um, I think it is about to happen at scale for one very good reason, to join the dots between those two comments in relation to greenwashing and stock drops, in relation to misreporting of financial results. Both companies and investors are about to, technical legal term, get bitten on the ass by this particularly in relation to financial misstatement. So at the moment, as everyone in this room would know, when you're putting together your financial statements, you have your central case. And your central case has to be, well, what do we think is likely? No one does one and a half degree financial statements because no one at the moment is putting their hand on their heart and we're saying, we think that's the likely outcome. The market signals just aren't there. So we can't do one and a half degree financial statements. So on that, I say, okay, what is the corollary of that for you being the central case? Necessarily, it's that your central case is plus two degrees, it's 2.2, 2.7. Show me how you have flow, uh, flowed that assumption set through your balance sheet. Show me how you can demonstrate that that has had an impact on your, every one of your asset useful lives, every one of your asset impairments, every one of your provisions for bad and doubtful debts, every one of your provisions for onerous contracts. No one can. It is staring us in the face in terms of material misstatement. So, so you think the next frontier is suing auditors? Well, no, not necessarily auditors, law but firms. that's certainly part of it. So law firms are going to get sued now? Well, there's very few of us that actually do review the financial statements, and then we don't do the numbers. We tend to do the talky-talky bits. Yeah. So you're thinking about corporates? Corporates and investors. When was the last time you kicked the tyres on the fair valuation of your alternatives portfolios? What do we do? I'm a, you know, formerly a pension fund trustee as well. What do we do? We go to the professional valuers. We never ask the professional valuers how they have taken climate-related assumptions into account in providing those valuations for us. There is a huge potential for this to change overnight when IWSB comes in. The problem is we should have been doing it now. So we're already misstating our financial statements. The second area in which there is huge opportunity, I think, um, is primarily in Matt's field, which is in relation to contract. So in addition to, to Latin, lawyers love French, well, one phrase, force majeure, which is the get out of jail free for unforeseeable acts of God. We chuck up the back of every material contract. And since Adam was a boy, it's been the clause that companies use to say, oh, look at this extreme weather event, unforeseeable act of God. Uh, we can avoid performance under the contract and we're not penalised for it. We, we don't have to, um, uh, have to be held to the bargain. There is a really, ex and this is how sad I am, I have a favourite case, a really obscure favourite case, single court in the Supreme Court in New York. 
um, that happened last year in relation to those once in a lifetime blizzards that happened in Texas in 2021, although I think they've happened three times now, those once in a lifetime blizzards in Texas. This concerned a wind farm called Stevens Ranch that um, had 256 wind turbines that stopped spinning with six inches of ice on them, who would have thought? Stevens Ranch had power purchase agreements in place or power supply agreements in place with Citigroup, who in the middle of a blizzard had to go out and buy alternative sources of power generation to on supply under its own contractual obligations and it had to pay a 3,000% premium on buying up this electricity in the middle of a blizzard. Cost them 113 million US dollars for one day's worth of generation. And so they turned around and sued Stevens Ranch and said, well, you couldn't supply. I was 113 million bucks. Stevens Ranch said, no, force majeure. Once in a lifetime blizzard, unforeseeable act of God. No, we don't have to. The court disagreed. The court said, and this is my favorite quote of all time, just because it was unprecedented does not mean it was unforeseeable. We have been talking about climate change for decades, not only extreme hot, but extreme cold. There were specific government reports that talked about the potential for extreme hot and extreme cold in Texas and actually recommending that the power generation sector weatherize their turbines. So the cause of the loss here was not the damage, it was not the blizzard. It was Stevens Ranch's failure to weatherize their turbines. So I think if you think about all the supply chain interruption that's going to go on now as temperatures change and all the contracts we have in place with bog standard boilerplate force majeure clauses, it is going to be a lawyer's picnic. OK, so I, I, but, I Can mean, I this, yeah, 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 no, please do. So, I, I, I've also got so that. If you, question. if you take that, that thesis, you can mm. then also see there's going to be um, the, 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 the insurance litigation that flows out of that in the same way that in the US you saw insurance litigation as another strand in asbestos or, or tobacco litigation. Absolutely. I mean, it's going on now. All that, with all the carbon majors claims in the US, a lot of the insurers are failing, to, uh, 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 are refusing cover. to cover on the basis that this is a pollution issue and covered under the pollution exception. And all the, the defendants are pushing back saying, well, hang on, this is a consumer protection claim against us. It's not about our emissions, it's about the fact we lied about our emissions. So you have to cover us. So uh, I think there's going to be a real shift in the insurance industry as well. I think insurance is really interesting, and I, I won't name the firm, but I know they received a letter from the professional indemnity insurers saying, are you training your staff and complying with the new law society guidance on climate change? And for me, that is a seismic shift of how legal innovation will have to happen to be able to be insured, to be able to get instructed by investors. Okay, so my question, I mean, for, for, for all of you, but uh, from what you were saying, Sarah, is, I mean, again, thinking of our investor audience, um, now, again, I don't know. I don't know this stuff. I don't know how they, how people currently quantify other non-climate legal risks or non-environmental legal risks. Uh, it seems to me as though quantifying the environmental legal risks and potential costs to portfolio companies is going to be uh, another big step up. In a different, I mean, who, if you are an investor and you are worrying about this stuff, where, where would you start? Yeah, we, um, we actually did a report for UNEPFI last year. Was it last year, year before? I lose track, COVID. Um, on um, the trying to quantify the risk associated with litigation the financial risk quantification. Um, and that built on some work we did for the EU back in 2017, I think it was. And our conclusion was, there is no such thing as climate litigation, it's just litigation. You've got to look across the entire commercial law book and it is actually really, really difficult to quantify, certainly to the level that well, banks in particular want where it's an algorithm that they can plug into their credit assessments. It's just not at that stage. That's for the next stage. We need to be able to get it to that level. Any other any other advice for investors from the from the, from the free advice for investors from lawyers on the panel? Well, this isn't new. Um, social impacts and environmental impacts and, and and potential liability have always been difficult to quantify, 
and people have always wanted to plug something into their model and it's, it's never terribly possible. And so there is, there is value in having directional ranges, which can be very wide ranges. Um, and that is probably the best that anybody can do at the moment. And there needs to be an understanding of that. Um, and, and move away from um, a checkbox type, I need a number and it needs to be very precise and I'm going to hold you to it because that's not how it's going to work. Mm. Yeah, we need, we need a climate culture rather than a compliance yeah. culture. Yeah. Yeah. Interestingly though, just thinking, I mean, I know that say for example, for pharma companies, pharmaceutical companies, there's a presumption that they're going to get sued. Mm. And that's taken mm. into account in their valuation. So mm. whether it's now time for that to occur with, say, or hypothetically oil and gas majors, that, that we need to kind of build in a, 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 a nominal discount and standing mm. presumption that there is an elevated liability exposure there. Don't I? I think, I think one of the things we do as well is we talk about time in every... Uh, investment meeting, every transaction, every company meeting, every board meeting. So we do that in different ways. So we'll say there's 46 board meetings to go until 2030, or there's this many weeks to go in this company meeting, and it just bookmarks everything we do as a process. And for us, that always puts into spotlight the urgency of what we have to do. And for me, that is, it's the quantifying that urgency and communicating that makes decisions better. Okay, great. Well, I, I, I'm, I've still got a lot of questions to ask you, you guys, so I, 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 we probably better move on a little bit. Um, and the, oh, I've, I've already got a question actually from the audience. Yeah, why not? Let's go. Have we got a microphone around somewhere? We've got a question in the middle here. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, hi, I'm Nikki. I'm from Friends of the Earth in the Netherlands. Um, I uh, come from a jurisdiction with quite innovative legal cases. Um, after the Agenda case, the Shell case, we're now sort of looking for our next innovative case. And I would say that uh, climate litigation is not, is not compliance, it's not risk, it's human rights. So also financial institutions have gigantic scope three emissions and are thereby at least partially responsible for climate change. Um, so I would invite you to think like, what are really the legal innovations that we need to further sustainable finance? I, I assume you talked about greenwashing, you talked about uh, contract law, you talked about disclosures. I assume it's not, another, it's not another one of these cases. So if you were really to dream really big, what would be the case that could further sustainable finance, according to you? Oh, great question. Uh, who, who wants to go first? I'd still be suing on the balance sheet. Simple as that. Misleading disclosure. It's the shooting fish in a barrel. It really is, and it's a simple cause of action to make out. Find a jurisdiction, not like the US where you need to enter, but say, hypothetically, Australia. It's, is this likely to mislead or deceive? You don't even need to show loss or damage or causation. Bog standard, simple. But it's interesting in Australia, and sorry, I'm, I'm hogging the microphone, so I'll shut up after this. Um, there's been a series of cases involving financial institutions around oil and gas company Santos and its proposed development of um, oil and gas off uh, the, the coast of the, the Northern Territory, in, uh, off the coast of Darwin, where in order to try and block this development, there have been cases in Korea against Kayshore and Kexum, the Korean um, Export Credit Agency, um, trying to invoke statute and constitutional law in Korea as to why they shouldn't be involved in funding the project. There have been planning and environment appeals, bog standard admin law appeals. And most recently, there have been human rights complaints filed against 12 domestic and international banks and 20 of our largest pension funds, arguing that by lending to Santos, and not project finance, bog standard general corporate purpose finance, by lending to Santos, without ensuring that there was free, prior and informed consent of the local Tiwi Islanders, that the banks and pension funds are in breach of their uh, commitments to respect international human rights norms. So human rights, I think, is, is, is uh, an avenue that can be followed, but I just still think we're overcomplicating it. 
just misleading or deceptive conduct, stock drop, boom. Everyone will follow. Um, I would like to move us away from litigation. I understand there's a role for litigation, but it's only a partial role. And, and there is a real need to facilitate investment at scale and at speed. And I think the way to do that is to, um, to refresh um, legislative arrangements, particularly around development consent, and um, to enable um, construction um, and financing of um, new and, and transitioning technologies at scale. And at the moment, certainly in a lot of um, the global north, that is just that, that's just being stuck in um, huge unwillingness to um, accept new installations. Now, I completely agree there should be processes for um, co proper consultation. But I think the ability um, to block those over time is, is proving incredibly problematic. And project finance does offer at least a well-trodden path to manage environmental and social impacts using World Bank standards and uh, some of the um, equator principles uh, practice that has evolved in relation to climate change, because I know World Bank needs to update their standards on that. So that's where I see a gap which is not well responded to. And there's a need actually for, for NGOs, corporates and institutions to push governments into that space. Um, yeah, I, I'm not a litigator, so I don't know, but I know how it feels to be sued as a, as a business and you almost, it becomes a battlefield and you entrench your position and you actually, ha it has this bonding effect within the organization being sued that you create these new connections and new collaborations internally. Um, I, I think we need to humanize the story of climate litigation, so actually go in for the hearts and minds and connect it to what is happening on the ground and I know you do that through your advocacy, but actually what it means in financial and human terms to the people who are bringing these actions and telling that story as the, as the four, rather than it being badged as this risk thing that sits on the company's balance sheet or a battle in the courts for the, for the privileged. I think that, that for me is where we've got to tell a better story mm -hmm. and through telling better stories we'll get innovation naturally. I think though there's still a rump that doesn't respond to, to any of that. Yeah. I, um, I was still a pension fund trustee when the, when the uh, McVeigh and Rest case was, was filed in, in Australia, which is the, the, the case where um, uh, now equity generation lawyers sued Rest Super, basically saying you're in breach of your trustee duties because you don't take climate risk into account through a financial risk lens. And every other pension fund in Australia just went, <gasps> what are we doing? So I think there is a role, a really strong role for litigation. Not, it, it troubles me when we're suing the good guys, and I'm not a litigator either, but you know, where, where that litigation where you're trying to stretch the good guys isn't necessarily productive, but there is always going to be a role for things that are not regulatorable, and yes, I just made up that word, on our books, which is what is reasonable, what is likely, what is foreseeable, and they are the precepts that all negligence law or contract law or disclosure law, that's what they're based on. Mm -hmm. And that's never, what that means is never gonna be set out in, in hard law. It's always something that's gonna be. Well, and I, I have no hope for laws because using my timeline of events to go to 2030, it took 685 days to enact the Environment Act in this country, 685 days. And since it's been enacted, it's 618, and the principal provisions haven't been introduced yet. So we cannot rely on our legislators to get there in time. So this is where we have to be, have, have the advocates from climate litigation, but have the groundswell of movement in the economic transactions we have that allows our legislators to be more ambitious. 
Anyway, here's a question, uh, actually, I'm, I'm, uh, so I'll come, I'll come back to the audience in a moment. I had a, had a couple more questions quickly. And this is one that has just um, occurred to me I would be very interested to know about. Now, one of the things that we often say in the financial sector, so actually in the sort of the, you know, the asset management side or the banks, which I'm f fairly familiar with, is uh, sometimes people do, there's, there's always, if you're in the sustainability side, you wonder just how far that actually reaches within the firm. I know everyone says that sustainability is in their DNA. However, I've met bankers, and, and it's not. Um, and this is simply not the case. I mean, there, and, and I think, for us sustainability people, it's always quite difficult to gauge just how deep this actually goes outside the sustainability team. Um, and yeah, I, I have my doubts about some of some institutions um, in the financial sector. What about in the legal profession? I mean, how, how far do you think this is? How far do you think this is sort of penetrating the sort of sustainability consciousness beyond those who are, who are sort of as yourselves directly involved in this? Oh gosh. Well, that, that was the whole point of Chancery Lane project: is that it was to mainstream it into all the different silos. So it was not about the environmental lawyers, it was about the corporate lawyers at the coalface of transactions having an awareness of the contractual provisions they can use to help decarbonize. So I think it is about breaking through those silos and creating those safe spaces to innovate. And I think we have to have them in collaboration with the clients. And that was the whole point is that the clients, the investors and the lawyers got in a room and tried to work out how to make a better tomorrow. And if you start with that as the premise, magical things happen. I mean, the love in that room in the, on the first, we called it a hackathon, was just sensational. So it, for me, that's a bit of a cultural shift, and that's what I was trying to allude to. And if you have a chance, look up the Keeling Culture, which is a new HR collaboration, which is trying to drive systemic change from HR teams um, within organizations. And, and I commend you all to, to go to your HR colleagues and get them to sign up on that. Well, I it's not, not legal related, it's <coughs> HR related. And, it, and it's really, really good, I can, I can recommend. Um, I spent a lot of time um, engaging Linklaters over the last four years in relation to this. And um, my observation was um, that we made a lot of progress. We made a lot of progress particularly using our friendship networks rather than particular practices. That what, was, what's a friendship network? Well, you know, friend, mates, people you've, you've worked with before, People who thought this, who, oh, right. people, like literal friendship, literal, yeah, literal. 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 It's like a like a subcommittee in no, literally, literally, literally your friends. Yes. <laughs> literal, you know, friend, you know, you start with a cohort and then you each talk to your friends, yeah, okay. um, and that works better than doing it in a very structured way. Um, there are some people who who just think more naturally horizontally, so you know, across sector, across um, practice. And you go with them, um, and that builds. Now, we, we also did a lot of training. We, we launched a big accelerator for, and we did it with Oxford, actually, um, for um, associates who were sort of on the cusp of partnership, and we did it globally and cross-practice. That created its own set of networks, and we got them coaching, um, and, and they had to develop business plans. Some of that worked, some of it didn't. And, and I see a lot of that happening across financial institutions. But, but I think we are very like financial institutions. You know, there are some people who get it and there are some people who don't. And you're trying to build out the percentage who get it more and more and show why it matters. Uh, and you use whichever levers work for them. Okay, well, again, uh, no, sorry, I will go to questions in just one minute, but I, have to, I do have to ask one more question myself because I know that I, I can't take the risk that it won't be one of uh, other, that it won't be, uh, that it'll be one of the questions you ask. Um, because now, I think, Sarah, you said to me just before this that in one of the other panels, uh, somebody had said they were sick to the back teeth of hearing about anti ESG and they didn't want to hear about any more about the anti ESG stuff and anti woke stuff today. However, we are on a a legal a panel with lawyers, and clearly that is a legal risk, particularly for, or, or a perceived legal risk, particularly for investors. So obviously two types of risks um, from litiga for litigation for investors through their portfolio companies, but also directly. And we've heard an awful lot about the potential 
um, antitrust, well, you know, is it or isn't it an antitrust um, uh, risk being part of uh, collective engagement strategies, being part of GFANS? Um, you know, again, Vanessa, you mentioned fiduciary duty. You know, we've heard a lot from the anti-ESG side about the fact that, that, that this is you know, a, a, a antitrust, that it is breaching fiduciary duty. What, again, sort of, as, as we now actually have some actual lawyers on the panel, we're not just talking about this theoretically, how real are some of those risks, do you think? Vanessa, do you want to start it? I think there are some risks where you have um, entities who together decide not to do business with particular other sectors. Um, but a lot of it is overblown because the, 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 the collaboration is about um, set it, setting ways of doing th things at a, at a quite a high level. So you don't get it, you shouldn't get into areas of antitrust risk if you are properly cited on the areas that you don't go into, which, you know, financial institution networks are typically well advised on that and are often lawyered on that. Um, so it's applying that in an ESG context. Um, there is definitely a litigation risk in the US, and it is also taking a huge amount of time and management effort and headspace, and that is unhelpful, but it's where we are. Um, in, in the UK, there is also a proposal for a, an anti-boycott um, bill that has just started going through Parliament, which is quite widely crafted, um, though it's more narrowly described um, in, in um, when it's introduced by those backing it. Uh, and, and it seems part, actually, of a broader political issue that we're seeing across the world. And what about the, just, just I'll come back to that, but then what about the fiduciary duty aspect of that? Just, if, I was going to say quickly, but if, if it's possible to answer that quickly. The, the so the, fi the, the fiduciary duty stuff, uh, again, I think has been somewhat exaggerated. I mean, neither of us are US lawyers, are we? You're not no, US no. Lawyers. So, you know, but, but um, if it, it's the obligation to, to focus on um, financial return. The, the, the question is um, the extent to which these, are, the, these factors go to that issue in, in an over what time period. And there are ways of managing that. Impact is the, so where you're prioritizing ESG over return requires more careful thought. Matt, do you? Yeah, yeah so, so I, this is an example where we need thought leadership because I think there's a, these laws I, I call the laws of mass distraction. So they get us into a tiz and we look at them and you're right, lots of people are trained on it. They know what they're doing in these collaborations. So what we actually need is for law firms to come out and say, no, this is fine without the quicksand of qualifications that normally comes with their thought leadership. And once we have that, we have that collective knowledge, collective cover that means we can press forward with ambition and collaboration. Sarah, any thoughts on, on that? Well, I think Vanessa and Matt have covered it up. Okay, fantastic. Well, in that case, I will, I will come back to the audience for questions. I see we've got several. I'm sorry, it's one of my weaknesses as a moderator. I have so many questions myself that I want to ask the panel. Um, we've got a couple over there at the back. Should we start with those two? Um, let's, let's have the, the two questions in succession, Thank please. you, Lucy. Yes, and a uh, fantastic panel. I'm Vesica Rolampio from EBRD. Um, so, um, a comment and, and a question to the panel. Um, I think Matt referred to the Law Society's guidance, which was recently published, groundbreaking. I was one of the authors, so I'm really happy that it was mentioned today. And more importantly, that the uh, professional body of solicitors in England and Wales has embraced it and is really promoting it. So a question um, is actually two questions. One is, um, to, the, to Vanessa and to Sarah, um, what's your stand on the advice the missions that uh, Matt mentioned about and has Linklaters or you know, other private uh, firms started thinking about it? So um, the other question is, I think also Sarah mentioned about increasing climate-related risks and due diligence and 
um, to what extent, so the first and foremost, I guess, um, duty of a lawyer is to act in the best interest of his or her clients. Do you think that it's the time now to talk about or to, to, to open up the interpretation of whether climate change now is expanding this, this duty of lawyers. So do they proactively need to take certain action to advise their clients? I think because I've heard that, um, you know, we need policy, governmental, you know, investors pressure, but what about the legal profession? So thank you very much. Okay, fantastic. We can have the question from the, from the um, gentleman in the white shirt as well, oh, please. Geez. All right, James Pilkington, Zoological Society of London. You've talked a lot about uh, the role of the legal profession in addressing the climate crisis, but I'm hoping that the panel will spend a few minutes on how they see the legal profession can contribute to solving the biodiversity crisis. Wonderful. Thank you for that question, because that was, uh, I was going to come to that last, and it's great that we've had it brought up from the, uh, from the audience. Um, so let's start with the ones for, for Sarah and, and, um, well, and, and, and Vanessa initially. Um, advised admissions is, admissions, is that something you're thinking about? Yes. <laughs> Would you like to expand on yeah. that a little? <laughs> um, so I, I think everybody is at an early stage on this. To me, it, 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 it's not surprising that, that over time we will be asked to um, communicate on that. Um, and you've developed a, bit, uh, a starting methodology. There, there will be a white paper coming out in the next couple of weeks. Uh, I'm looking at Amy, maybe. Um, maybe if we get there. Um, but so, so people are thinking about so it, but it will take a while. Yeah. It, it's, it's, really, it's really complex and um, you have to look at it. Do I do the advised emissions at client level or do I do it at matter level? Um, do I take into a, account the other people that were advising on the transaction? Where do we get the data from? Does the client want, you know, want this information? Um, but ultimately, it's going to be a really valuable tool for um, innovation within firms, recruitment, um, business development, collaboration with clients. I think that that's why it's really critical. Um, and just quickly, Vessi was one of the authors of that guidance for the climate change um, uh, guidance for the Law Society, so she deserves a round of applause as well in my head. Um, yes, Sarah, go ahead. Um, we're definitely thinking about it. If you think about in the context of uh, Australia, where our uh, economy is very, very resources heavy, it is a significant issue for law firms. Um, I think the issue that's really prompting thought on this is the fact that in this last 12 months, the insurers have started asking, who are your coal, oil and gas clients? It's qualitative, it's not quantitative, but geez, it focuses the mind. And then what then on the, uh, the other question that Bessie was asking about the, uh, the sort of the duty to clients and uh, to act in their best interests and does climate, climate change um, sort of change that, equa shift that, that equation? I think we're negligent if we don't. We're like you're, you're reviewing a contract and you don't consider privacy issues or you don't consider warranties or anything like that. I, you're just giving negligent advice because you can't be considering, you can't be identifying the relevant risks if you're not thinking about what the World Economic Forum considers to be seven out of top ten of the biggest risks by impact and likelihood to the global economy. How can you do it? We're risk advisors. And we will manage that risk, so I expect every retainer now excludes any risk related to climate change advice, unless the client asks for it. Yeah. Same as tax, they, they always exclude yeah. tax and retainers. Yeah. Okay, and then, um, sorry, and uh, we have the biodiversity one next. I think we will have time for a couple more questions, so if you're still waiting, don't, don't panic. But um, biodiversity, uh, obviously super interesting. It is a subject, certainly on the investor side, that is just attracting so much attention at the moment. Getting people getting excited about potential opportunities in biodiversity, people also getting very worried about the risks to portfolios and obviously to society and, and, and you know, civilization um, of, of biodiversity loss. Now, some people have said that maybe um, in, in, various, in various ways, you know, that's people saying, okay, well, we can use 
the biodiversity, the template we've created for climate for biodiversity. I mean, we've had the, we had the TCFD, we've now got the uh, mm -hmm. TNFD, Task Force for Climate Related, Task Force for Nature Related Disclosures. Um, there are various other nature biodiversity initiatives that have been kind of modeled on the climate equivalents. Now, whether that always works perfectly, I don't know, but clearly there is a lot of learning that's been done from the experience of climate. Does that, is, does that also apply in, uh, in, in legal terms? Is there, is there you know, it, it, can, can, the climate play, can the climate legal playbook be used in uh, biodiversity and nature? Absolutely. Um, although I think about it in, a, in an even more basic level, which is climate, financial risk and opportunity, as is biodiversity on steroids. So again, it opens up the entire commercial law book. Um, it would be remiss of me not to um, give kudos here to the Commonwealth Climate and Law Initiative and Jeanetta and Jenny sitting there in the front row who have recently done a seminal work on fiduciary duty and biodiversity that's available on the Commonwealth Climate and Law Initiative website. We actually, as early as 2020, also published a report called Gathering Storm, which looks at the evolution of biodiversity to be a financial risk and opportunity and what that means for liability exposure. So I think it, to a large extent, will follow the climate playbook and will be um, accelerated in terms of impact because of the climate playbook. The one issue I think um, that companies haven't appreciated with biodiversity and transition plans and transition risk so unlike climate, where there are a lot of technological barriers to change, for example, and say steel or cement, there are none in biodev. You can shift tomorrow. So it's got to be a lot harder to, once you've made a commitment, to hide behind that hard to abate argument. That's interesting. I hadn't, I hadn't thought of that aspect of it, but no, that, that, that makes a lot of sense. Vanessa, your thoughts on the biodiversity? So I, I think some of it is transferable. Um, I, I, where I've worked on biodiversity, there, there, are, there is quite a lot of technical complexity that is in some ways different and is more complicated than climate. So it's hyper-local for one thing, yes. whereas climate is global, yes. It's not fungible. Yeah. And, <laughs> we can use the word fungible. And <laughs> so... Um, we don't have enough, we actually, we don't have enough lawyers who know much about biodiversity. Um, it's quite, it, if you think climate is a small group, biodiversity is a tiny group. And they're um, all environment and planning lawyers. Yeah, and again, so, again, so we, need to, yeah. We, we, we need to grow that as well. Not that there's anything wrong with that. So, Matt, what about a, what about a, uh, a blip then? A, a, a cliff. A, 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 a biodiversity <laughs> law innovation fund. Yeah, I mean, I think that'd be brilliant, and I'm sure um, CCIL would love some funding to do that. <laughs> um, it's, it is more complicated to do biodiversity, but I think we need to have some recognized concepts a bit. One of the tipping points for, for climate contracting was the concept of net zero being widely adopted. So what is the equivalent in biodiversity that then can be put on the agenda to cascade through contracts and economics? So, in the same way that we're doing supply chain cascades with, with net zero, and that can be as simple as you will set a net zero target within the next three years of our relationship, what is the equivalent for biodiversity? And then do you start with water? Do you do bees? Do you do birds? It, what, it, it's just really, really complex. So somebody needs to create a taxonomy that can simplify to net zero that allows the lawyers and the investors to drive change through their economic transactions. But what we could do in the meantime, those of us who've done biodiversity work, we could, we could aggregate those kind of clauses we and should. share them. <laughs> we should. Do and you, and yeah. Chancery Lane Project would love to look at that at some point, does, does I'm sure. But well, we haven't got funding and we're not allowed yeah. to do that. Right? <laughs> <laughs> no, does, yes. does the global biodiversity framework get us part way there? in terms of being you know, the equivalent of the Paris Agreement, but for biodiversity, because it sets quant targets. Well, and, and obviously we do have TNFD coming in September as well, which is you know, on, the, on the disclosure side, yeah, it's adding a, another level to it. I, I think there's a whole translation into mm. the world we live in. So yes. I, when we were talking, when I was in the brilliant water session this morning, and I was thinking about energy performance certificates, and do you need a water performance certificate? 
is what I thought. And it shows you the escalator of technologies you can use in your business or in your home to save water. And I was thinking, well, there's nothing like that for water or biodiversity, and it's not in our economic atmosphere at this at ecosystem yeah. today. So I think it's how do we translate biodiversity? And I'm not the I'm not the expert to do it, but it sounds like we can collaborate as lawyers and with our colleagues in the wider economy and, and finance to, to create that taxonomy, to translate it into the everyday. Okay, well, I mean, I would, I, I, biodiversity is one of my, um, one of my sort of uh, areas I'm particularly interested in. So if you, if you, if and when you do decide to do this, please do loop us in on the conversation. We'd love to, we'd love to hear about it and we'd love to, to cover it in Responsible Investor. Now, I said I would have more questions, but I do see that it is 31 minutes past four and I don't think anyone, I know there are a couple of people who want to ask questions. I'm sorry, Mike, and I'm sorry, whoever else it was, but I think the rest of the audience is not going to forgive me if I go over too long on, on this session, um, given that it is the last of the day. So uh, I will just, uh, the one thing I should say before we finish is that after this, there's a half hour break or sort of for a transfer, and then we're all going to Sheldonian Theatre for the closing debate, which is, uh, I remember the topic is, what is it? Well, it's, it's um, this house believes that uh, 1.5 degrees is still alive and the financial sector helped to get it there. Um, now, I don't know if any of, any of you went to the debate last year. I don't need to tell you how, how brilliant it was. Uh, if you didn't go, this is nothing like any of the panels you've been sitting through today. It is a proper, they do a sort of Oxford style debate. Everyone, the speakers really let themselves go. And there's a, it's, a, it's a really sort of combative, fun atmosphere. So really, you know, don't, don't, don't miss that. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be brilliant. Um, but yeah, I'll let you all go go, for, go off to that. But thank you very much indeed for sitting through this with us and for some great questions. And above all, thank you very much indeed to our lovely speakers. Thank you. <laughs>